Yeah, if I'm you have try any. That again. Okay, okay, you gotta. You gotta I was gonna you let you, but you don't. Up. I know, but you I'm have to talk. If I stop you. talking, you have to stop sl- for no, even a split. No, if I stop. <laughs> I know we're just filming this argument. If I. So yeah. We... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put the outtakes in there. Hey guys, I'm Ryan Kirkland, and this is my wife, Monica, and we just wanted to jump on to talk about what we're excited for in phase two. In phase two, as we move forward together, we are gonna meet in homes and do more small gatherings uh, together. And so we did that this weekend. Yeah, we just invited some some neighbors and some close friends over to kind of have a house church slash watch party. Um, and we're still encouraging those who are sick or immune compromised to stay home. Um, but we were able to do it while practicing social distancing. Yeah, we set our room, our living room up in a certain way that we could all, you know, s- stay safe and, and stay connected with people who have certain comfortability levels. Yeah, we all miss like gathering together on Sunday mornings. Um, and while we really look forward to doing that in the later phases, for now, we just want to encourage you whether you want to join a house church or whether you want to start one of your own, we just encourage you to start looking for um, those ways to connect again. So yeah, we just wanted to jump on and encourage you to do the same, that you could start inviting people into your home and starting to meet together and reconnect um, as a church body over the summer. Yeah, and if you do, we'd love for you to tag us at mvc.life. We love seeing what you guys are up to. And if you have any questions about groups or how to join a group or how to start a group, um, you can email tracy at mvc.life. Welcome Mountain View Church. I'm so glad you're here for the Sunday morning service. I see you over there grabbing your coffee. Grab your coffee, you over there. Get your coffee and your communion stuff. Don't forget, okay? We're gonna be taking communion together. And then you over there, too much creamer. Bring it down a little, you know? Um, I'm just so happy to be here, like literally here. I'm on campus. I'm in one of the classrooms. I haven't been here since the beginning of quarantine, so I'm a little bit excited. So forgive me for my enthusiasm. I um, am stoked you're here for those of you who are new and in another state. It's been so fun having you join us from all over the United States. So we're so happy that you're with us. So um, you probably heard uh, that we are moving forward with um, starting to meet again, but we're not going to be meeting as a large group yet. Okay, so we have an alternative plan that I think is actually better. That's gonna cause you to be more um, connected than before on Zoom. We're gonna start meeting in small groups. So those small groups that have been on Zoom, you can meet together personally. And for those of you who are there in, um, in a house right now doing a watch party, we are now wanting that to happen more and more. So I want you to contact me if you're interested in opening up your home for a watch party. I will send you just some, just some simple things to consider when you open up your home for having people come in and we can start meeting again in smaller groups. So I'm super excited about that. Um, I also want you to realize that uh, you guys have been doing an amazing job being the church. You have, your feet have been on the ground. You've been loving your neighbors. We've been donating blood and giving food and and keeping our eyes open for um, people who need um, care in this time. If again, if you're somebody who needs some extra help um, during this weird season, I want you to um, contact care at mvc.life. If you know somebody out in the community that needs some help, again, care at mvc.life. And then um, if you are gonna be opening up your home, I would love for you to let me know. And my name is Tracy, I'm the group's pastor. So you can contact me, Tracy at mvc.life and let me know what your plans are. And then if your home is open for new people, then I can let the whole, not the world, but our church know, okay? So again, welcome. I'm glad you're in your jammies. I'm, this is the first time I haven't been wearing my jammies out and about and I'm kind of excited. Um, enjoy your, uh, the service, enjoy your coffee and enjoy whoever you're with. Love you guys. Father, we ask you that in our homes, in this church, 
all around where we're watching, no matter where we are, that your spirit would just come right now, Lord. And in worship, we would feel your presence. Lord, that you would be right there with us, no matter where we are. Bring us close to you, Lord. Help this message to reach people around the world, Lord, not just here in Orange County, Lord. Our, our message is healing across the whole world, Lord. And we ask you, God, to be with us, to give us strength, to help us con to continue to get through this time. We just ask for your healing power to go across our families, our friends, our neighbors, and anyone that we come in contact with. We thank you so much, Lord we get to do this, we get to be here and gather in your presence. In Jesus' name. to bow chains have no choice but to break shame has no choice but to leave in your presence he has no choice but to bow chains have no choice but to break shame has no choice but to
head to bow Chains have no choice but to break Shame has no choice but to leave In your presence We're just gonna keep singing that And I want to invite you to sing that over your homes that fear has no choice but to bow, chains have no choice to, what to break, and shame has no choice to, what to leave in your presence. And that would be something that is not just felt in your homes, but is felt in your county, and is felt in your state, and is something that reverberates across the world because there's so much uncertainty right now. And that uncertainty is brought on by fear. But fear has no choice but to bow by the name of Jesus. Chains have no choice but to break, but in the name of Jesus. Shame has no place in the name of Jesus. So I want to invite you, you have the authority to sing that over your homes in, this morning. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Do it again. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. So let the spirit rise up, let it break through the walls, beat down the doors, and crash through the windows, and cover the earth, the earth, the earth, the earth. Let the spirit rise up, let it break through the walls, beat down the doors.
before us and you are behind us and you are there and are waking and are weeping and are rejoicing God and that in these uncertain times you are so present in the world God let us not forget the favor that you've poured upon us God let that be something that is a constant reminder every day the blessing that you've bestowed upon us God Thank you so much.
his face shine upon you be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace Good morning everybody Today is one of the biggest holidays in our Christian year that we often overlook. We know about Christmas because we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus when God became human and dwelt among us, showed us what was possible for us as humans as well as what God is really like. We celebrate Good Friday because of Jesus giving his life for us, going all the way down into death, taking all of our sin and shame upon himself and all of the things that, um, all the injustices and violence um, of a broken world system upon himself. And then we see in Easter Sunday this triumph over death and over the greatest thing that we have to fear. And we've been celebrating these and then Jesus ascends into heaven and and, and we remember his, um, the fact that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, that all authority in heaven and on earth is his, and now he is reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. And then comes Pentecost. Pentecost is this celebration seven weeks after Passover, after Easter, after the resurrection, um, where Jesus sends the Spirit. He had told his followers to wait for the Spirit. It was during the Jewish festival of first fruits where they bring the first fruits of the, of the, um, the harvest, the spring harvest. And um, it's a sign of more to come. And it was always, you know, went together with a, a, a celebration of um, when God gave the law to the people of Israel, the Torah from Mount Sinai. But we believe God gave us something better than the law. He actually gave us the law to be written on our hearts. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us himself at Pentecost. But what I don't think a lot of people realize, like I think there's a lot of Christians that think, yeah, yeah, I know we got the Holy Spirit. But um, like a gift that you got at Christmas that was kind of stuck behind the Christmas tree and you didn't quite see it until later. Or maybe you got it, but because you got so many gifts, you packed it up and you stuck it in the closet and you never actually took it out and read the manual and figured out how to use it. I think there are, there are at least six gifts that came with the Holy Spirit that, um, that I want to tell you about today because I think as Christians there are a lot of us that are not taking full advantage of those gifts. We haven't opened them. We're still leaving them in the box. And, uh, and I hope as a church, this Pentecost, this, as we celebrate this, this day and commemorate the day the Holy Spirit came, we can remember uh, the gifts that are ours because of what happened and that we can open them. And by faith, we can begin to step into uh, enjoying the things that are rightfully ours. And so there are six of these. And the first one is this gift of motivation. <laughs> You know, as I, as I talked about, the, the festival of the first fruits was about the giving of the law. And in the Old Testament, um, the motivation was keep the law because if you do, you'll be blessed. If you don't, bad things are going to happen. Uh, all of the, the laws in Deuteronomy say that. And it's kind of written into the, uh, the wisdom of the Old Testament as well. But the problem with what the law could do is that the law could never actually make people good. They can't actually change their hearts. You can tell people what they should or shouldn't do and what the penalties will be for that, but you can't actually change them unless you do something on the inside. And our motivation that happened on Pentecost changed from an external motivation of trying to keep laws because of the threat of penalty or the, um, you know, the promise of reward 
it changed to an internal motivation because God said, I will put, well, he said this in, in Ezekiel. This was the promise that was coming. It was in Jeremiah too. But a new heart I will give you. A new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a tender, soft heart. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my, audience, uh, my, uh, my audiences, my ordinances. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's God who works in you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. He gives us the desire to do what he wants. That's putting his law in our heart. But then he gives us the ability to carry out. One of the things that happened at Pentecost is we got a new heart. God actually gave us his spirit to change our hearts, to change our motivations so that we want what he wants. At your deepest heart level, you want what God wants. And this is really important because you actually have to believe this. I grew up believing that my heart was desperately wicked. <laughs> Who could know it? I didn't trust my heart and I didn't trust the heart of anybody else. And there are a lot of theologies where people talk about the hearts of people as if they're just wicked and you can't trust anybody. And there's this inner suspicion already that we have about other people. And we know ourselves and we know a lot of the things that we do and, and we blame it on uh, our heart as if like um, the core of us is really bad and rotten. And what I got to say to you is that changed at Pentecost. If you put your faith in Jesus, if you receive God's spirit, you no longer have a hard heart, a wicked heart. You have his heart. Now, you may not be in touch with that heart. You may have all kinds of wounds and baggage and fears that keep you operating in patterns that you've always operated in so that you stay stuck, so that you continue in sin, so that you do things that you would rather not do. That stuff's all embedded in your body in your habits. But the first step to actually changing those habits and overcoming that sin is to believe that you have a good heart. And the, the first step to becoming the kind of community where we give each other the benefit of the doubt is believing that each other has a good heart. To believe the best about each other. And because of Pentecost, we can do that because our, our motivation has changed from, from just external trying to stay out of trouble or to get reward to internal where we actually have the love of God, the heart of God in us to want what he wants and the ability to carry it out. That's the second thing, his strength. We actually have strength to carry out what God's given us. Uh, Jesus said this when he was getting ready to ascend. He said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This, this promise that they would have power to do what he's calling them to do, th this promise came to them as a, um, well, th that they were going to not just have authority, but have power. Remember when Jesus in the end of Luke, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and therefore I tell you, go and make disciples of all nations. There, Jesus said on the basis of his authority, he deputized them with authority to go out and act on his behalf. But here, when they wait and they receive the Holy Spirit, they actually have the power to go with that authority. Now, I always um, have used the illustration or example of the difference between power and authority as the difference between a policeman's badge and a gun. A policeman's badge it gives him the authority to enforce the law. You know, we've seen in recent weeks people that were not policemen going and trying to enforce laws and do citizen's arrests and things like that and abusing authority that they don't have. We've seen other people that are in positions of authority but that have abused their power as well. As happened with George Floyd and all of the, um, the, the reaction to that that's going on in Minneapolis and, and all over. Um, but there is authority and there is power. 
And as Christians, we have authority in the spiritual realm and to act on behalf of our King, Jesus, as we submit to him and the authority of his government. Remember we talked last week about being dual citizens. We are under the authority of Jesus and, and authorized to act on his behalf. When we pray for people, you'd be surprised how much spiritual authority you have in the spiritual realm when you pray for people. But now you not only have authority in Jesus' name, that's why we pray in his name, that's the act of authority, that's the badge, but you have power by the Holy Spirit who lives in you to actually affect change. Because of Pentecost, you have the power to carry out what he said. You have the power, and part of what he said is he wants us to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and do the work of God in this world to fight against oppression and you know, injustice and racism and all the things that are broken in this world, the restoration of all things that Jesus wants under his authority as we pray on earth as it is in heaven and we see his kingdom come and his will be done. We have not only authority, but now we also have power to carry that out. So you have this new motivation, you have this strength, and we have unity. May not always feel like it, but actually, this is huge what happened at Pentecost because Pentecost is a reversal of what happened at Babel. Remember the story in the, the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, about the Tower of Babel and people trying to build a tower to the heavens, and, and God says, man, if they can do this... Um, they basically created some technology and created this tower and they were trying to make a name for themselves. And God says, look, if they could do this, um, nothing will be impossible for them. So God scatters them all over the earth and he confuses their language so they can't understand each other. And this is the way the Bible gives an explanation for why there are so many languages and people groups and races and you know, all these groups all over the earth. But what happens at Pentecost reverses that. Instead of scattering everyone and confusing their languages, everyone is gathered and they are given a common language and an ability to understand each other. It says when they heard this sound of this rushing wind, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? See, whatever this language gift is that, that God poured out on this day, it was a reversal of that language curse that happened at Babel. And rather than scattering people, it was to bring them together. And the Holy Spirit unites people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And when we see this picture in the book of Revelation, we see in Revelation chapter 7, it says that around the throne are gathered people from every tribe and tongue and nation. Every ethnic group, every nation around the world, we are one family with one king around that throne. See, what the Holy Spirit did at Pentecost is he brought together the diverse world that we live in. And we still have a long way to go to be able to experience the unity that he already accomplished. I mean, certainly Jesus did it in his death that he did on behalf of all of us. He did it in his resurrection that he did on behalf of all of us. He did it even in his incarnation in becoming human on behalf of all of us. The one new human that we're all connected to, that we're all built after. He's the, the prototype. But in Pentecost... The same spirit that came to live in people from all over the world that spoke all different languages enabled them to understand each other. See, we talk at Mountain View about unity and about keeping the unity of the faith. We don't create it. You don't even need to create unity. We just need to keep it. Not only do we have this unity, but we also have equality. 
It's one of the things that happened at Pentecost, one of the gifts that we sometimes don't quite open. It, when Peter was asked to give an explanation of what happened, this is what he said. He quoted the, uh, the prophet Joel and he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Two things, just real quick, to notice. In the last days, Peter was speaking about his day as the last days. So those of you that are, keep asking, are we in the last days? Yes, we have been since the day of Jesus. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. See, before the day of Pentecost, there was all kinds of hierarchy. In the Jewish system, there were priests, high priests, you had to go before them. You had to do all of these things in order to be uh, deemed clean. And they had the authority to pronounce you clean, to pronounce your sins forgiven. That was part of the reason they got so frustrated at Jesus, because he kept telling people they were forgiven when they didn't jump through all the right hoops. See, but Jesus levels the playing field, and, and especially in the spirit coming at Pentecost, because now it's not just men that are in charge of everything. It's women that also get to hear from God and get to speak for God. It's not just adults. It's children. On your children, I'll pour out my spirit. And it's not just those that are in the economically advantaged positions and that are the, the bosses. It's even the servants and the slaves and the people that are in you know, economically disadvantaged positions. It, it leveled the playing field to where Paul later says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Those old distinctions passed away. There is equality because of the spirit. Because the same spirit that lives in the high priest now also lives in the servant and the child. You know, and there's no junior Holy Spirit that the children just get the little one version. Like, they get God too. This is why when you guys are in your homes and you have this opportunity to, to have church at home with your kids and to build in the lives of your kids, like sometimes your kids are so much better at praying than you are because they have faith and they're just simple and they trust. They have the heart of God that's in them, that's given them a new heart and this motivation. They have the power that they don't even realize they have, that they also carry that authority that they don't even realize that they have. But all of this through the Holy Spirit. Now, the body is arranged now by gifting and not by birth. And this is why we have women that are pastors in our church, powerful pastors and leaders you know, we, um, because they have, they have God's spirit. And, um, and you know, this, this is different than the idea that all opinions are created equal. I know everybody thinks that just because they have like a, an opinion that it, it makes it equal to the experts and to anybody that's studied their whole life of a certain thing. Like, it's just not the case. But can God speak through anybody and everybody who has a spirit? Yes. We can believe that God can do that and that he wants to do that. See, we, the Holy Spirit has given us this gift of equality, moving from hierarchy to empowerment. And he's also given us this supernatural ability, ability that moves from just the natural to the supernatural. See, all of us have different gifts in the natural world. We have, some have more aptitude for sciences, some have more aptitude for the arts, some have natural ability in athletics. Some are really great in school. Others are really great in, in building things. Like we all have natural abilities. But with the Holy Spirit, there is also supernatural ability. This is what it says. that They, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. 
See, the Holy Spirit gave to the people on that day abilities that they didn't have in the natural realm. Abilities that otherwise uh, they wouldn't have been able to do. And part of what it means to be a Christian is that God has given you abilities in the natural world that you're called to steward and to use for his service. If you are a leader, lead. If you're a teacher, teach. If you're a carpenter, carpent. (laughs) Or build stuff, I don't know. Do the things God's given you to do. Some of you love to cook. Listen, cook. Make people happy. Make me food. I, I would love to have food. Make it for me. Bring it to me. I'll eat it. But God's also given you spiritual abilities. And those aren't limited by what your natural abilities are. Sometimes they're strange, like speaking in languages that you never learned. Sometimes they're, you know, more straightforward. You know, there are spiritual gifts that are listed as like teaching and Um, you know, evangelism that seem like things that anybody can do. But there are some people that are specially gifted in these things, in prophetic gifts, in the ability to speak for God, in the ability to hear from God, in the ability to pray. Some people, when they pray for you, they seem to be able to, to heal you, like they have just gifts of healing. Some people have that and they they realize it early on and they go into medical fields, but some people just have gifts and they can pray for you. Listen, your ability is not limited by your natural capacity. We have a supernatural capacity because of the Holy Spirit, but it takes practice and it takes a, a process to continue to grow in it. Finally, the last thing that's a gift that I think a lot of us really have left in the box is the very presence of God. You know, God went on the day of Pentecost from with us to within us. He went from, there was a temple in Jerusalem and God lived in the temple. That was where people expected God to be. And then God lived in the very person of Jesus and it was great that Jesus was God with us and he walked around with his disciples but he said, I know I'm with you now, but it's better if I go away, because if I go away, then I'll be able to send the Holy Spirit, and that's better. Because I'll not only be with you, I'll be in you, within you. This is what Peter said when he got to the end of his message, and people said, what in the world are we supposed to do about this? You know, God's doing a new thing. He's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. He's uniting people from all over the world. He's giving them supernatural abilities. He's putting their law, his law in their hearts. He's doing all this. What do we do? And Peter says this. He says, look, repent, which means turn around. Stop going in the direction you're going. Change your ways and be baptized. Be initiated into this new family and every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then as you do that, as you come to Christ, which is what that description of repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, that's trusting in Jesus for your faith. And if you've already done that, then look what it says. It says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift comes with all these other gifts that I've just been talking about. Those are all aspects of the one gift that you get. And this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Look, you are now God's temple. He doesn't live in buildings made with hands. He did that for a time. He chose to do that. He made that an opportunity. But listen, Jesus didn't die for a building. He died for a people. And the church isn't a building. The church is a people. And you're that people. And there's a lot of talk these days about people wanting to, hey, when are the churches going to open and get back to church? But listen, you're the church. Are you open? The Holy Spirit lives in you. You have the heart of God in your chest. You have the power of God in your hands. You have the abilities of God, supernatural ability. 
You have a unity as one. And when two or three of you are gathered, he's not only in you, but he's in your midst as well. We're the church. And in this next season, as we move forward together through this summer and beyond this pandemic, like, we get to be the church. We get to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We get to be the very presence of God on this earth, in your neighborhood, in your home. And, and it's all of us. It's equal. It's your kids. It's you. It's the men. It's the women. There's no, like, it's not just the pastor and the church leaders and the, you know, overseers. Like, we all have this spirit of God, we all have the power of God, we have this authority, this ability, and we have his presence with us. We carry it. We carry it wherever we go. And so I, I leave you with this question. Which of these gifts do you need to take out of the box? You can take a picture of this if you want to be able to discuss it afterward. Uh, our hope is that you guys are, are meeting with at least your family or at least a couple of families or inviting neighbors or meeting in homes like you've been hearing about. As a church, we have an opportunity right now not just to be the church in our own home with our own family, but together with others from church, together with our neighbors to represent Jesus the reason it was better that Jesus go away and send his spirit is he could go farther. He says, you'll be my witnesses here and then in the next place and then in the next place and these movements outward until the knowledge of God covers the earth as the waters cover the seas. But man, if we're gonna get that job done, we need to take the gifts out of the box. <laughs> so which of these do you need to take out of the box? Is it the motivation thing? Believing you have a good heart and that others do too? Is it the strength thing, actually understanding the authority and the power that you carry? Is it the unity thing? Not getting sidetracked by all the things that could divide us, but focusing on what unites? Is it the equality thing? that You didn't even realize that you were empowered. You were waiting for somebody else to authorize you. Tag, you're it. You've been authorized. Is it the ability thing? Is it the presence thing that God is actually in you wherever you go? Look, they're all yours. They're all yours. What are you going to do about it? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you most of all for your spirit that takes all of it um, and processes it through our lives to bless others. We ask that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, what a great service. Always a great service. I'm shocked that I get to be on the staff. I'm shocked at the quality of talent we have to produce these um, services online. And if you're new, and, or if you aren't new and you haven't had a chance to subscribe, can you do that? Because even as we start um, being able to meet as a large group, we're still gonna keep this online presence. And we want you to be able to have access to everything that we're doing there. So subscribe, you'll see that on the screen. Um, if you need prayer, uh, go to prayer at mvc.live and we will um, schedule a one-on-one -on -one prayer meeting with you. Um, those have been super powerful. And then uh, lastly, if you're gonna um, open up your home for a watch party or you're gonna have a small group, can you let me know? Again, I'm the group's pastor and my email is tracy at mvc.life and I'd love to be able to support you in um, getting that going. Have a great day, guys. Bye.